So um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order the meeting of the regional uh, school committee at 6.30 p.m. This is a virtual meeting through Google Meets and is being live broadcast on Amherst Media on channel 15, and we are being recorded. I'm going to start with a roll call of everybody who is present in this meeting, beginning with myself, Allison McDonald, present. Um, Benjamin Harrington. Present. Carrie Spitzer. Present. Peter Demling. Present. Margaret Stancer. Present. Ron Menino. Present. And attending from the district, Superintendent Michael Morris. Present. Doug Slaughter. Present. And Emily Gribko. Present. Thank you. So our first, uh, I will also just restate um, that we are, we all will remain muted until we are speaking um, and I will recognize you once I see your hand waving um, so that I know that you would like to speak um, and we'll all pause until you unmute yourself. Um, so um, our first uh, order of business is to review and approve minutes from our meeting on March 10th, which was our last in-person meeting. And if folks can see that it, it is being, um, Dr. Morris is, is sharing that screen um, with the agenda there as well. Mr. Slaughter? Just have a correction to the minutes. Um, in the approval of the items uh, for the capital plan, there's a laundry list of, I think, 11 or so items. Uh, Roman numeral 10, which has, um, I believe it's the uh, access point listed as 15,000. That should be 20,000 instead of 15,000. Okay. Mr. Demling? Uh, yeah, so just a couple of um, minor edits on number three, item number three, um, Tracy Novick was there and was helpful in sharing information about regarding school choice. Uh, it was more focused on the Student Opportunity Act than school choice. And then on item number four, just a typo of Representative Dome should be D-O-M-B. That's it. Ms. Spitzer? Sorry for the delay. Um, also, minor typos on three. It should be Andra Rose, not Andrea. Um, and I made some additional edits that I'm not able to bring up right now, but I will. They were also very minor. So. I had a minor edit on point G, public comment management. Um, but halfway through that paragraph, it said Mr. Demling said this is policy D E B H. It should be B E D H. Any other? Seeing none, um, does anybody want to make a motion? I'll move, I'll move to approve uh, the minutes of March 10th as amended um, just now. I second that. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Stancer. All those in favor, we'll, um, I'll remind, we have to do a roll call vote for all votes on a virtual meeting. So um, roll call vote, uh, Mr. Harrington. I abstain. Ms. Spitzer. Um, Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Aye. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And McDonald, aye. Passes unanimously. 
eight, zero, or seven, six. <laughs> Do I hear six? Sorry. Okay. Um, next order of business is uh, public comment. Um, we had offered to take public comment by email um, to myself as, as acting chair um, and any public comment that we would, um, would have received, we would have um, shared on screen and potentially read aloud. I did not receive any public comment um, as of actually even as of now, just before this meeting. Um, so I'll just remind any of our community members that are watching us online. We are always um, open to public comment, even when we're not meeting, using the email school committee at arps.org, or to individual members and our individual member email addresses are listed on the school committee website at arps.org. Moving on to new and continuing business. Um, tonight we have two new policies, EPSLA and EFMLA, um, that we um, will review and need to vote on. Both of these are policies that are um, were drafted and proposed by council um, to recognize the the new uh, federal um, provisions for sick leave, emergency sick leave, and emergency family and medical leave um, policy. These were that those those regulations were effective April first, um, so we um, do need to enact these pretty quickly. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Morris or. Uh, Mr. Slaughter, if there's anything um, that you would like to add. Dr. Morris. Yeah, so uh, typically the policy process would work a little differently than this is working. However, um, in this instance where there's um, both the state of emergency in Massachusetts and as well um, as the steps the federal government had taken, the legal advice we received from, uh, from council was that um, we wouldn't take the typical steps. Um, certainly if you don't vote it tonight, you know, the body doesn't vote it tonight, doesn't vote it tonight, but uh, that typically would have first read, second read, policy subcommittee, uh, but this is really compliance with the federal law in, a in, in an emergency situation. So his recommendation was to forego the typical policy approval process given the factors um, and that it's, uh, these are both policies that are supportive of um, staff members um, and we wouldn't want to wait for um, our policy. In his opinion, we, um, the district wouldn't want to wait for the policies, uh, the gap, the policies became effective April, uh, April 1st, uh, regardless of what the committee did, but just having a long gap where there's a change, there's a, a difference between federal law and district policy, um, he felt was inadvisable. Mr. Demling. Um, Dr. Morris, could you talk a little bit about how um, this new benefit would be communicated to employees? particularly in like the current environment where there's so much information under the greater category of COVID-19 um, and just how, how we're gonna ensure that people clearly understand what's available to them. So the advice that uh, we received from council was to share these policies with um, the bargaining units. Um, Non-unit steps a little different and, and we would have to work on that a little slightly differently um, and then work with the bargaining units um, to communicate out to their members. Um, these potential benefits. Um, and I think that's actually in the statute that, you know, once our policy is passed, that uh, that would be the preferred method of working within, if we're in a unionized environment, which we are, that we would work through them um, to communicate to members. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer. No, I think it's great that we're doing this. I'd be, given the environment, I think it makes sense to, to vote as soon as possible. Um, can I just uh, uh, clarify one thing? Are we an employer with fewer or more than 500 employees? I wasn't sure how it would break down in terms of, because of our weird district nature. And, and could you just comment on that? 
Sure. So the 500 piece, uh, my understanding, which is um, not council and I haven't gone through this, um, but I did ask that question, is there's later provisions in the law that, that aren't necessarily shown in the policy because the law is a lot longer than the policy, um, that that's more geared towards private sector employees than public sector employees, that public sector employees, even if they have fewer, um, are still, um, and I can't remember if it's encouraged or required, but I think it's the latter, um, to follow this statute. So really the number of employees is, is a little, when you get into the fine print, my understanding is that applies more to private sector um, organizations as opposed to public sector. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, um, does anybody want to make a motion? Mr. Demling. Uh, I move to approve policy uh, EPSLA as presented. I second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Spitzer. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll uh, start with a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Harrington. Abstain. Ms. Spitzer. Ms. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And McDonald, aye. So it carries five, zero, one. Does anybody want to make a motion on the other policy? Ms. Spitzer. I move to approve policy EFMLA as presented. Moved by Spitzer. Second. Seconded by Demling. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none. I'm actually gonna go alphabetical order this time. So um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, upstate. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. So uh, it, this policy passes uh, with a vote of five, zero, and one abstention. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item B on our agenda, which is COVID-19 update from, from Dr. Morris. Yeah, so this is a somewhat lengthy update. Um, and so I apologize for that. The other thing I shared with Ms. McDonald is once I'm presenting it, I'll share the screen so you can see the slides and not just see an email that I send out. And, and I think it didn't perhaps get to Mr. Slaughter or, or Ms. Gripko. So, um, but I won't be able to see you. So if there are questions, um, I'll stop multiple times to see if there are questions. But if there's a question on a particular slide, I'll just rely on Ms. McDonald to call on someone because I won't be able to see a hand go up. Um, and it was one of the things in putting this together that was incredibly difficult is the number of people who've played a central role over the last, I would say, month uh, in supporting the district, supporting students, supporting staff is way too long to put in a slide deck. And so I had to make some intentional choices about the most relevant information for the public to see. But I want to start with the caveat that there's a lot of things that have happened that I can't fit in slides because, you know, I presume you don't want to be, I guess you'll be where you are all night, but you know, you don't want to necessarily be on a, on a, on a, on a phone call or in a, a meeting all night. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to apologize and have that caveat in advance that I, I captured a lot, but there, there's a lot of things that I didn't capture um, because it's been um, a pretty, um, it's been a time where everyone's stepped in with both feet and I think, uh, you know, compliments to everyone who worked for the district for that. So I'm going to share the screen so that people can see the presentation, um, which I'll bring up. All right. So, um, Get this out of the way. 
Um, and can you all see the slide? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, the objectives for our response, right? You know, you can see them. I'm not going to read all of them, but you know, communication was incredibly important and continues to be. Um, thinking about our students and and teaching and learning um, course is central. Uh, technology barriers, uh, we know they exist, particularly in this environment, and uh, all the steps that that we're taking to try to minimize those barriers. Uh, food insecurity is an issue everywhere. It's certainly a uh, uh, important piece for our families. Uh, the mental health needs of staff and students, um, incredibly um, central to how people are feeling these days and, and how they perceive and interact with, with others in a virtual environment. And then, of course, you know, what can't go unstated is revising systems so that the core operations of the district continue, um, that, that the district still exists, even though students and teachers aren't coming into the building and, uh, and many other staff as well. And, and how does that work? So um, I'm going to go through the objectives. Um, I'll probably stop after each to see if there are questions. And then the second half of my present or second, the last third of my presentation are just a couple of things moving forward. Um, this has been mostly ongoing and, and previous work, and then the, the last couple of slides we'll talk uh, more about next steps. So, um, you know, some of the steps we took, um, you know, I think we're up to 15, but 16 sort of happened tonight. We just don't have it on our website yet. Uh, but we've been trying to keep uh, all, all members of our, all stakeholder groups, uh, families, um, and staff members uh, involved and included in all of our communication. One thing that's come up is we haven't been sending direct emails to students, particularly at the high school level, and some high school students haven't been uh, thrilled to receive all the information from the families. The flip side is that we have students, even at the high school level, who receiving emails about COVID-19 can, can create a lot of anxiety and family members who have asked us not to. Um, so, you know, it, it's been a hard one to balance on the direct connection to students, but we've been, um, certainly sending those emails, trying to keep uh, families and staff in the loop, and then trusting families to talk to their children in the ways that they feel are appropriate. Uh, we developed and maintained a COVID-19 website for families in the community. Um, I'm not necessarily going to click on that link, but you all have the link. It was emailed to you. And we also developed a COVID-19 website for staff. Um, so one of the things that we recognized early on, uh, really staff members brought it to me, uh, was the importance of having uh, video contact, that not just relying on uh, emails because we all are getting too many these days. And so each week I send a video update. I've, so I've done four of them to staff. Uh, principals are sending them home, uh, particularly at the K-8 to level, regularly um, to students and families that are more directed actually at students. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a good medium for communication that way. We've utilized our social media platforms. You know, fortunately, unfortunately, people are on social media perhaps more than ever before. Um, so we want to make sure that our Facebook, Instagram, and, and Twitter accounts are, are communicating that information out as well. Uh, we try to really maintain some of our normal structures. So every Friday, we have an ARPS update that goes out, a newsletter, and that continues even during this time. Uh, we want to maintain some, some um, kind of structures and remind folks that we're, everyone's still working incredibly hard in the district to, to, for the betterment of students. Uh, more recently, we've developed systems and templates for staff to use with Distance Learning 2.0, which I'll get into a little bit later, which is starting um, on Thursday, you know, more of an orientation day, and then more in full uh, the following week, and communicating them widely with staff and family. So that just happened in the last two days um, that those templates and systems were developed. And really, we want to, uh, as, as we've had more time to develop and the longer this goes, to make sure that students and uh, families and staff know what to expect, uh, what assignments will look like, especially at the high school level, since it's a credit, no credit piece, what that means, and when their math teacher and social aid teacher will be in touch with them. Um, so that all went out um, at every school uh, in the district um, today. Uh, to families, uh, we're, most of them are translated. The translations will go out tomorrow, but we wanted to really get them out uh, as soon as possible, and staff had them, uh, were able to offer feedback, and most of them were really developed by staff, um, actually pretty much all of them. Um, we also have shared new tools. Uh, I think a, a number of staff members want to be connecting with families by phone uh, for a whole host of reasons um, that may be preferable. It's an option. No staff member has to. Um, but we've provided different ways where they can contact families or students via phone uh, while maintaining the privacy of their personal phone number. Um, so there's kind of three different methods that we've shared with, with staff because we want to promote uh, that communication happening in a way that protects staff privacy. We talk, I, frankly, we 
talk all the time to town officials and public health departments. Um, it's worth noting in the region that there's four different public health departments that we're communicating with. There's the Amherst Health Department. Uh, Pelham is part of a consortium with Ware and Belchertown in their health department. And for Leverett and Shrewsbury, I know those reps aren't on this call. They each have um, smaller public health departments. So uh, that's been a little bit of a challenge to be candid with you, but everyone's been working very hard and very well together. Uh, last week, I participated in the Amherst Town Hall events, two of them with the town manager and public health department, which were great. Um, and as you hopefully aren't sick of yet, I'm providing daily updates to the school committee of the different things that are going on because um, we haven't been having quite as many meetings. So before I go to um, distance learning, I'll just see if I'll pause there and see if any committee members um, or anyone who's on the call has any questions for me about communication. Anybody have questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Then I will, oops, I started from the beginning, my apologies. Um, so then I'll go on to do the distance learning piece. Um, and um, I think I'll just roll into it. So uh, at the beginning of the closure, we filed the DESE guidance, which was to provide enrichment activities to students. Um, we received new DESE guidance on March 26th. This was, uh, I think, uh, shortly after the governor had extended the closure period to May 4th. Uh, with a transition to learning what we're calling distance learning 2.0, which is, you know, we tried that distance learning piece in the enrichment, and this is uh, a more organized, structured approach. Uh, what DESE guidance, and that link will bring you to that guidance from the commissioner, uh, learning for approximately half a school day, uh, and that distance learning is more than just online learning. In other words, it's not just, you know, a lot of colleges have gone on, the, the classes operate at the same time, they just happen to be online versus in person, and that's not appropriate in Desi's eyes nor mine to do at a K-12 level, pre-K-12 level. Um, two additional documents I shared with you here. There's um, new Desi guidance that, that derived from federal guidance, actually, the U.S. Department of Education on students with disability, and that's a little more directive than some of the other uh, guidance that we received. There's, you know, really talking about two types of remote service delivery options, supports and resources, and services and instruction. Um, so that's more directive, particularly the second and bullet point there. I think it's worth noting that uh, IEPs are not, it can't quite be followed in this setting in terms of the number of minutes, but it's what we uh, have been told to do and endeavor to do is make our best faith effort. Uh, some, some disabilities modifications accommodations are a little easier to manage in an online environment. Uh, others are more of a challenge. And what our team is working on, um, I think incredibly well, is thinking about the range of students with disabilities and what makes sense for each individual student. Uh, and what sessions make sense for each individual student. Uh, one of the things that we continue to hear is students are missing seeing other students. And, and so the idea of co-treatment or having students in small groups for treatment um, is, is something that students have expressed an interest in. And we're working on those models um, and starting implementing next week on that. Uh, ELL guidance came on Friday, which is a little late for us because our documents had already been put together. Thankfully, they really matched what our plans were. And um, that one has a focus on oral, oral language development and, and trying to do more, you know, in all of these, there's opportunities for live instruction or synchronous, what we call synchronous instruction, as opposed to asynchronous instruction. But for ELL students in particular, it's really important that they're talking and listening uh, in live ways. Um, I'll just speak a little bit more and then we'll stop for questions. So uh, after we got the guidance from DESE, we had a um, the way we modeled it is we had 150 teachers, paraeducators, and administrators in 13 different groups, uh, over 150 of them, developing documents last week. We sent them to all staff on uh, Thursday and Friday of last week. We got a lot of feedback on them, uh, met again, and, and made adjustments and edits. And that's sort of the nature of it's an iterative kind of process. And we wanted people doing the work uh, to be creating the documents and leading the work. And I think we were successful in, in providing opportunities for staff to do that. Uh, I think also noteworthy is that Tim Sheehan, our curriculum coordinator, held open office hours uh, on Google Meets Hangouts like this uh, that were well attended by staff to problem solve. Um, and as we transition to Distance Learning 2.0, our student service and ELL administrators were also going to um, start including open office hours because what we know is that this is a very different form of education than what uh, staff students have experienced before. And we're going to learn a lot as we go, and we want to provide vehicles uh, for that feedback loop to go uh, for administrators and staff and problem solving, frankly. Uh, staff have been having faculty meetings led by principals and department heads, um, that's particular at the high school and then curriculum leaders at the middle school. I think one of the things that's worked well is, um, you know, like at Crocker Farm last week, there were 90, 91 people on the phone, right, because we were able to include paraeducators as well. 
and people are missing that uh, their connections. Uh, people care deeply about the work, but they also care deeply about their colleagues. And in this socially distanced, or what I call physically distanced time, making social connections is, is incredibly important. Uh, all documents will be finalized and shared out with staff and families this week. This, the ELL one is going to be finished tonight, and as well as my cover letter. Uh, and that'll uh, most of it went out, um, but all of it will go out by the end of the week. Um, and this Thursday is really an orientation day to distance learning 2.0. What we think about, um, ooh, there's a typo there. Um, so when we think about distance learning 2.0, the way we're describing Thursday is it's like the first day of school because it really is going to be a, a different experience for students and faculty. Um, and I should say we'll begin in earnest Monday. I think that, I believe that's Monday, April 13th. Uh, so I apologize for the date error uh, on the slide. And I think that's, yeah. So I'll stop and pause and see if there's questions on distance learning. Does anybody have a question? Mr. Demling. Um, yeah, so thank you for this presentation. This is very helpful. Um, so two of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about must be ch current challenges for you are, what's the status of the MCAS, particularly with right. our current seniors? And when when uh might we be going back to school when we when 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 it's likely that we we're going back to school and i know those are big questions that have gotten a lot of state coverage um, but it seems to it seems to me that if you don't have a, a decent guess about what those two uh answers to those questions that it's, it's kind of hard to to um architect something uh, for the next four weeks versus the next 10 plus weeks so do, do you have any yeah. Clearer sense from DESE or from the state uh, in terms of guidance on MCAS and um, and return date, if if there is so going to be a return date, date this clear. Sorry, Peter. When I can't see you, I don't always know when people are done, so I apologize uh, for trying to uh, no, unintentionally cutting off. Um, so uh, MCAS, I'll speak to uh, return date. Uh, will be a pretty healthy conversation a couple slides later. So if you don't mind holding on that, you're absolutely right in what you said, but I'd, I'd like to put it in a larger context uh, a little later in the deck. Um, for MCAS, uh, my understanding is the legislature gave the commissioner the ability to make a decision on MCAS. Um, federal government has allowed states to waive uh, the annual testing requirement. And to date, we have not heard anything from the commissioner uh, nor the governor uh, on that particular topic. Um, which seems odd to a lot of educators because MCAS would have started a couple weeks ago. Um, and there's an interrelationship, I suppose, between when we return, but even on the earliest return date, which is May 4th, which I find incredibly unlikely, as I'll describe later, um, it's hard to imagine how all the MCAS tests could fit in. Uh, and I will say, educationally, uh, the last thing I'd want students doing after they were home for an extended period um, in some, some degree of physical isolation is to provide a standardized test. That seems like a very odd choice. And, and again, I'll get to that later about uh, some initial thoughts about when students return, where, whenever that is. But the idea of social emotional learning being part of a, a community, uh, and that's not just for students, that's for adults too. Um, we're getting too, I find myself getting, uh, it's getting too normalized that I'm on calls like this. And uh, when I'm back in a normal, traditionally normal situation of being with people, that's going to have to be an adjustment for everybody. Uh, so the idea of doing MCAS seems very unusual to me, uh, but I'll certainly update the committee as the commissioner shares any information um, about that. But it's um, many other states have taken that step, and many educators uh, across the Commonwealth, I think, find it are quizzical uh, or um, odd that there has been no um, public dialogue on that from the commissioner to superintendents. We had been having weekly meetings uh, with the commissioner of education, and, and we didn't have one last week, and we have no information about one this week. Um, so we're not quite sure why that communication loop has slowed down either. Mr. Demling. Yeah, uh, so thank you for that. Um, and so just before we drop the MCAS uh, topic, I'll just say from a school committee point of view, I think it's pretty ridiculous that the uh, state leadership is dropping the ball on this, and I, I hope they do come to their senses soon. Are there any other comments, Ms. Spitzer? So could you say a little bit about um, what the students are expected to have access to at home? I know, um, I know there's been a movement to try to, and maybe this is on other slides, so feel free to punt. 
Um, but I, I think it would be good to know not only for the traditional learners, but also the students with um, an IEP or the English language learners, like, what supports are we offering to make sure that they can have access to the distance learning that we're providing? So when I send slides, like, I don't know, an hour before a meeting, that's on me, uh, but we will get to that in a little bit. I apologize for the late timing of you receiving slides, um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, I'll be able to answer that question fully very shortly. And my apologies for the late send. Yep. Ms. Fitzer? I just want to also just add that I really appreciate the focus not solely on the academic, but on the social emotional, because I think I think the idea that we'd all just be carrying on as normal um, learning at home is is one that um, is just totally unrealistic. Um, I, I guess the follow up to that would be for because it's not only the students whose lives are disrupted, but the teachers' lives who are disrupted. Yeah. And as a parent of three young children. <laughs> um, I could have a lot of empathy for a teacher who who may be in a similar situation and unable to deliver. Um, at least I'm wondering if there's been any, um, and maybe it's too soon, I know we're still adjusting to this, but are we seeing that we're losing any teachers or what kind of accommodations are we making for those who might be in a similar situation? Right, so I think- We just passed. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, what we have been seeing is incredible work by our staff. I again want to compliment them. And I think like many uh, people, uh, we're providing, or many, org hopefully districts, we're providing organizations. For instance, we're not mandating what times staff are working. We're just trying to mandate what work goes to students. So for some people without kids, they may work a pretty typical, you know, they might do their work during typical work hours. And I got an email from a staff member uh, yesterday uh, who is saying, you know, based on, you know, her family, and it could be not just kids, but also people caring for their parents right now as well. So I just want to broaden that, you know, I know not that you were being narrow, but I just, there's a whole lot of um, stresses on everybody. And so uh, this person was saying that, you know, they're able to tape, you know, or, or do their work after their kids are in bed or after they're caring for, for parents. So we're providing that flexibility. Certainly, we're not advocating exclusively for live instruction. I think that some teachers have taken that step and other teachers um, for a whole host of reasons have not. And uh, what you'll see in our documents, um, you know, if you didn't receive them yet as parents, but certainly we'll have them out on our website in the next day or two, is that it provides a lot of flexibility for that. There's also the piece about live instruction and being uh, over-reliance on that because not every student may be available at the same time. Um, based on their responsibilities. We have students who are caring for their parents or their grandparents or their younger siblings. So there are some real benefits of asynchronous uh, pieces, whether it's emailed uh, work, but also um, you know taped lessons. Um, there's some real benefits to thinking about asynchronous work as well. Uh, and the way we've approached it with staff, uh, with their support, is really providing a menu of options and making sure the communication's happening uh, and that um, education's happening. Uh, for students, but not really mandating a strict schedule or exactly how it has to be, because we know that staff members, uh, like everybody else in, in the country and the world right now, are under significant stress. And while the work needs to happen, we're not going to define exactly when it happens or exactly how it happens. It's more just making some commitments about what um, what students receive and making sure that they're being supported in the learning. Sorry, that was long-winded. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Ms. Gripka? Um, so as a high school student, I was just wondering if there's going to be any more communication specifically from the school aside from just teachers or like hearing stuff from our parents, if there's going to be like any more of that. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. And one of the things that uh, Principal Jones and I were talking about is, you know, while we have stayed away from communicating um, specifics around COVID. This is really about um, expectations for student and teachers. So we sent that to parents today, but I think we're likely to send it to all high school students tomorrow um, because this isn't something that should cause the same level of concern in terms of anxiety. I mean, students may have anxiety about the plan, but, but it's not quite the same uh, situation. So, uh, and high school students are a little different. And I think it's worth noting this. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. Um, high school students are the only, and this we're following the commissioner's recommendations on this, uh, there is a pass, uh, excuse me, a credit, no credit, um, quote unquote grade that students will receive for the second semester work if they're in high school. Uh, we're not grading in terms of uh, affecting GPAs or getting an A or A plus or B minus. 
nothing like that. But at the K-8 level, uh, we're following the guidance uh, and recommendations of the commissioner that there are no grades. Um, so we, we're encouraging students to participate and families to support their students to participate. Uh, at the high school level, it's a little bit different. And that's also the only level where uh, new instruction can occur, like new topics uh, can occur. Um, so it is a little different and we will be communicating that directly with students. The same documents, it's not, um, it's very accessible for a high school student to read it. Uh, but we'll get that out to students tomorrow. And the same for Summit Academy as well. When I say high school, they really have two high schools in the share building and, and while they have different documents, we're gonna share them directly with students at that site as well. Okay. Any other questions for me? Not seeing any. Okay. So. All right, so on to Ms. Spitzer's question, minimizing technology barriers. Um, so the IS department has been, in terms of staff who've been in the building the most, uh, I think probably them, the business office and food service, but the, I think they may uh, quote unquote win that um, competition, so if you will. Um, so they started, uh, our, our middle school, high school has one-to-one -one programs. So all of our seventh through 12th grade students have uh, Chromebooks. There was a couple of students who left them in school and we, we sort of have managed those uh, pretty well. Um, at grades three to six, students have Chromebooks, but they don't go home. So we distributed 117 in the week and a half after the closure started. Um, and then we, we recognized while well, we reached out to everyone, you know, more grades three to six, the longer it took, right? Some families said, I don't really want my kid to have a Chromebook. And then as they realized, whoa, this isn't going to be two weeks, uh, more families reached out. And we have uh, added a second distribution, distribution for those students, but also looking at K to two students. Uh, so that's taken an incredible amount of work for. Um, Mr. Champagne and his team, uh, because those students don't have Google accounts. So if you don't have a Google account, a Chromebook doesn't work. So they created Google accounts uh, for a couple hundred kids um, in grades K to two, uh, bought cases, because these Chromebooks didn't go home, so they didn't typically have cases. Um, so altogether, we've, as you see, we've, we've, um, we've gotten 330 Chromebooks to students in grades K to six, uh, which, is, which is not an insignificant percentage of the total number of students in those grade levels. Again, only the students who requested them. Um, we have about nine or 10 that now have requested them, you know, so we will likely have to do a third round um, of Chromebook distribution. Um, I think the other step we noticed is that uh, many families don't have internet access. So a Chromebook again, uh, or any device, but particularly a Chromebook doesn't work. If you don't have internet, you, you can't be, um, not much happens in the Chromebook. And even if you have, if you're using a, a personal computer or a laptop, um, so much of this requires internet access. So uh, my one regret is that I spent, uh, we spent a week, week and a half trying to work through different ways like Comcast and all that. And I'm not trying to knock on Comcast, but a lot of these other vendors who are trying to offer internet access in certain ways, and for a whole host of reasons, they were not effective in working, in being able to support the families we needed to support in our community. Um, so what we did is like Cambridge, other communities have done, we, we ended up knowing that mobile hotspots were the, were the way to go. So we purchased 95 of those, uh, they came today. Uh, they have to be set up and they have to be, we, we are legally required to set up filters for a couple different things uh, when we're giving uh, internet access um, either in the school, but also um, even in people's homes if it's coming from us. So that'll happen the next couple of days. Um, I wanna note that uh, we'll talk about FY21 budget later and if that's related to the FY20 budget in terms of E&D, but um, as we've agreed to uh, compensate our staff for the rest of the year uh, and don't have as much revenue coming in, uh, the umbrella PGOs organized, uh, it really came from one PGO who reached out to me and said, how can we help? We want to do something. We obviously can't open our doors to people, but we want to, we want to, we want to help. What are the needs in the community? And they then uh, initiated with me a conversation with all the PGO leadership and all the schools in the district, um, and started an amazingly successful fundraising campaign to support not just the hotspots but also the data plans that come with them. Um, and um, I'll let them, you know, they can share. Uh, how much money they've raised and, and the incredible work they've done. But the, the community outpouring of support for this has just been incredible. Uh, the other thing that you realize is I'm always looking for silver linings in life and perhaps a silver lining in this is we've recognized how much of a digital divide has existed uh, that we knew about and hadn't taken the steps to do. So I think long-term, this is a conversation we all need to have. And by we all, I mean literally uh, the community as well as the school committee and administration. 
Um, so we're now gathering, we did an all call on Friday and we're getting lists from families because our all calls don't cover the 40 languages that all of our um, families speak. Um, so our teachers are helping us and principals are helping us by sending lists of students who do not have Wi-Fi in their home. Um, and once this setup is done, we'll be starting, we'll start the distribution of hotspots. And the other nice thing about hotspots is once they're configured, they're plug in and play as opposed to uh, other forms of getting Wi-Fi access. Um, so I want to say an incredibly large thank you to our uh, PGOs who took this on and have really mobilized the community to support students um, to have access during this time, especially with the extended absence. Um, we had a separate group uh, last week that formed, I think it's, it's pretty big, it's 10 or 11 people, maybe even more, a uh, group of paraeducators and, and teachers from the schools, and Jerry Champagne was on there too, who were interested in providing trainings for staff, because what we know is that this is a, a big transition for staff, as well as it is for students, and perhaps for staff, uh, perhaps, it's, uh, for some staff anyway, it's an even larger transition uh, than for students. Um, so there's there are trainings today and tomorrow that were live. There's also tape trainings they've shared. They have a, their own website so that people can go back and access it. And they've just been absolutely incredible in supporting their staff members. Uh, they've also developed tutorials for families on what we're doing in Google Meet and Hangout and other tech topics that we'll be sharing with families. Um, and, and as I said at the beginning, just uh, sounds like I've, I'm doing a lot of thanking people, but people deserve the, the public recognition. Um, the IS staff members, a couple working remotely, and, and a couple have been in, in the buildings throughout. Um, they've provided these resources to our families. And as we've moved to a more virtual world, uh, the number of questions and emails uh, are just incredible. Uh, and the needs are incredible. We don't really have the capacity to add staff uh, temporarily at this time. Um, and they're working incredible hours to make sure our families um, have access to what they need and our staff have access to what they need uh, as this transition takes place. So I'll pause and see if there's any questions. Thanks for all of this and also thanks to the PGOs and everybody else who's working so hard on this. Um, one question I have about the hotspots is um, say we had a hotspot that was in an apartment complex, would that hotspot be able to serve mm -hmm. multiple families or is it a one family per hotspot? So that's something that we're looking at as we develop the list of students. Um, the hotspots, um, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on the proximity of apartments. They're not big enough where they could serve, like, you know, there's been some urban areas where like, um, you know, like they have a huge one on a bus and we looked into that and, and for a whole host of reasons that didn't work for our needs here. Uh, but we are looking if there are families, for instance, in, a, in adjacent apartment buildings, it's possible the hotspot would be able to serve both needs. Um, so it is something as we're getting our list of students that we're organizing it and, and trying to look at uh, proximity and, and whether that can help. Any other questions? I'm seeing none. so. I think we can move on. Okay, sure. And I'll try to pick up the pace. I know this is a long presentation, but it, there's a lot happening and I had a hard time, again, shortening it. So the food insecurity piece uh, between our nutrition services and our partnership with UMass, we're serving over 2,000 meals, about 2,500 meals a week at 14 locations, 13 in Amherst. And as Mr. Minino and Ms. Stancer will be pleased to know, uh, our first one started in Pelham uh, yesterday uh, with 23 meals uh, picked up uh, at uh, from Pelham. So. That was a nice addition, and that really came because the federal government and the state government allowed for uh, some different flexibilities um, for us and for other districts to do. Um, starting last week, we added a large number of meals to our Friday delivery, so the weekend scarcity issue has come up, and so there's four meals going out on Friday instead of the typical two meals, so that uh, hopefully it helps people get through the weekends. Uh, starting next week, we're actually going to be shifting our model. We're going to maintain the same number of meals, but reduce the number of drop-offs. And that's really just because of the rise of COVID that we're seeing locally uh, and recommendations uh, from folks in the nursing and the health field. Um, we want to still provide the same number of meals, but again, reduce the, the amount of potential contact. We do do it in a physically distanced way, but the reality is when you're out uh, in the field, um, we want to reduce that as much as we can. So we're going to reduce our pickup days to three days a week, but still be providing four meals at each time. So we'll, we'll be providing the same number of meals next week as we as we are this week. And, you know, our nutrition services, our UMass partners, our family center, the van and bus drivers who are doing the routes. And we have many, many staff who are just volunteering to 
do this because they want to see their kids and families and they, they care about uh, food scarcity. So we've had an abundance of volunteers that's maintained because, you know, you always, you always concern when you ask for volunteers, the, the first go around, you get a lot and then it's going to uh, wax and wane, but we've really seen a pretty steady stream and uh, the UMass partnership has really helped us in terms of just maintaining, you know, keeping a reasonable uh, capacity that we have to sustain as well. So uh, we feel really good about what we were able to provide to our community because we know the needs are great and they're not slowing down in terms of needs. They're only accelerating uh, for families. Um, and there's a lot of concern, I'll be very frank, about you know what, what happens if this goes on, can we sustain it? And we've committed to sustaining it throughout the end of the school year. I think that's the only slide on that one. Any questions on the food insecurity piece? Um, Ms. Stancer. Can you describe what happens when the meal is handed out? Yep. So there's a there's a locate at each location. There's tables that get laid out, and then there's um, boxed bags uh, with the food in it. And we uh, ask people to be um, sort of organized and come one at a time and and stay six feet apart, as the recommendations are. Uh, for that, so that it's very controlled. Um, it's not like we have groups of families or groups of our staff uh, gathering together, but what our volunteers are helping the van driver get the meals to the table. Uh, we wait till families have done the pickup, get the tables back in the van and go on to the next location. Ms. Spitzer. So I just wanted to clarify something that I believe is true, but I wanted to just confirm is that these meals are available to any uh, young person, person under 18 in Amherst, is that correct? And they don't necessarily need to be a student at our, in, within our district? So here's what I will say, and I'll be careful with my wording. Uh, according to the reimbursement policy of the USDA, they are designed for students aged five to 18 who attend our district. However, uh, we are not required to check or uh, there's no, um, there's no sign up sheet or sign in sheet or notation needed for that. And so uh, when families come to our locations, uh, we take them at their word and we want to not make sure we want to make sure that families in general in our community have food. Um, so that's as far legally as I can probably push the conversation, but I think you probably catch what I'm um, what I'm indicating. She gave it a thumbs up. We don't turn people away. I mean, that's the, the blunt part of it. Um, I can't see. Okay, sounds good. Sorry, since I can't see you, I'm getting like only feedback is a blue screen. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Menino, did you have a question? No. Uh, seeing no other questions, I think we're good. Okay. So the last one, no, second to last one, support mental health. Um, right, so our educators school-based support, right, they continue to engage students in social, emotional needs and counseling needs. Uh, the Transition to Distance Learning 2.0 included a group of counselors um, that Mr. Shea, who was principal at Crocker Farm, but used to be a counselor at both the elementary and secondary level facilitated uh, and provided additional structure and organization for office hours, for ways for families and students to get in touch with counselors um, and, and provided, yeah, again, more routines and structures around that. Uh, in our academic areas, we're very clear that we need to start lessons and start uh, with acknowledgments of the challenge the epidemic is causing um, that we, we, we think the academic structure that will support students is good for their social emotional functioning, but not at the exclusion of acknowledging the situation we're in. Um, and I'll share the next slide shows a, a slide that I shared with many of the groups working on the academic side. So we just, so it was a, it was a nice placeholder, um, kind of informational, um, I guess visual to support that. For our staff members, we have an employee assistance program, which is a free confidential professional counseling uh, program that's continuously available to any staff member and it's free on demand. They are now because of the situation, they're offering free on demand seminars, workshops, and resources through their website. Um, so they're supporting staff in multiple ways. But I want to show the slide uh, that I took completely, you know, from um, someone named Jessica Minahan, who's an expert on uh, anxiety. She's come to district multiple times. She's based in Eastern Massachusetts, but she's written a, a number of books and uh, just remembering, and, and those of you who've taken like Psychology 101, you remember this as Maslow's hierarchy, and uh, really thinking through what Maslow's hierarchy is right now. I think all of us are sort of intuitively doing it, but really making sure that uh, that where school sits on that, that 
uh, for many families, the psychological needs, the safety needs, um, the feeling of love and belonging, particularly in this environment, how esteem works and, and self-actualization, right? Those things are going to come before school right now. Um, and so I really like the quote at the bottom too, and I'll read it just for people who aren't seeing this. Clearly, our kids and families need us more than ever before, more than ever um, to model social emotional learning before content. And that's really our focus, and that's going to be true at the high school as well as kindergarten, right? It's going to look a little different and be and 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 be implemented and realized slightly differently, but everyone has the understanding and the acknowledgement that one of the best things about being more structured in our approach to supporting distance learning is that there's that community feel can come back a little bit more than it has. It's not just about the academic piece; um, it's really about that community and making sure that every student, you know, for many students. At every grade level, the adults in their school are adults in their life that um, they rely on, uh, not just for teaching and learning, but for many uh, less tangible factors. And we want to make sure that we're recognizing that that's very real for students right now, that their, their, their sense of isolation is, um, is very real. And it's, it's, um, we need to lead with that. Um, so um, I'll stop there before I get into my last section on the current systems, uh, and then we can get to thinking about the future, which I think um, I imagine you'll have a lot of, uh, the committee will have a lot to say on that. Are there any questions on this section? I'm seeing none. So the last one, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, again, because of time, I'll roll through. So, you know, Mr. Slaughter, could, Dr. Slaughter could certainly talk through this, but, you know, we, we have to make sure people get paid. And some of our staff, many of our staff get direct deposit, which is easier. Some needs, need checks printed. Uh, we have contracts. We have vendors. We have mail to get because our schools are closed. And so Dr. Slaughter is involved in that. Uh, how that process works. And so uh, that's a critical area and a critical need. And, and thanks to Dr. Slaughter and his team has gone off incredibly smoothly given the situation. Uh, human resources, we're still hiring. So the, you know, the middle school and principal Pelham searches are moving forward uh, with virtual semifinalist interviews. Um, they're done for Pelham and they'll be done for the middle school by the end of this week. Uh, and, you know, by see the 15th we're hoping to get a number of other job postings out what's a little hard is we don't exactly know what the budget's going to be so that's going to limit us but we have some positions we know will be open regardless of budget and, and we're going to try to work on that uh, virtual health insurance enrollment from hr uh, began on april 1st and and that's gone incredibly smoothly usually there's a health insurance fair and different things but we've moved to a virtual environment um an operations point i can't say enough about the facilities and maintenance team uh, sanitizing, cleaning, how that went, especially the last week in school and the first week after, uh, maintenance that we're still maintaining things like fire inspections. Um, we're still talking about larger projects uh, and we're continuing to buy, you know, different products for sanitizing and cleaning um, that are going to make us, this isn't a short-term problem. Um, so the custodial crew, the maintenance crew, facilities, transportation, uh, they've done just incredible amount of work, uh, and that's why we're in as good shape as we're in. And so oftentimes they're the unsung heroes of the district, and, and they deserve to be recognized. So I want to really stress that. Uh, another thing I want to say is that we've moved to a virtual registration. So we have, uh, last week, we put out that we have an online kindergarten registration, and we have like 35 students or so by the end of today had already registered, which, um, given what everyone else is dealing with, was actually out it was higher than uh, what I expected. I know this is a regional meeting. We'll probably talk about it at the Amherst level when next time we meet. Uh, but we're going to have the same virtual registration system for students at all grades who are moving to the area. Uh, I think moving to the area is probably going to slow down a little bit. But the, the kids who are already here who either are going to transition from private school or charter school to our district um, or are planning to move here in the summer, uh, we'll, we have a nice system set up where we can take most of their information virtually. And when our schools open up again, they'll have to bring in uh, some of the other documentation that we need to see literally live according to current law. Um, but that, that's that gone very smoothly. And again, that, that was a combination of our family center, our IS team, WS Moreland, our communications team. So um, those things really matter that we're maintaining our systems uh, in the middle of this crisis, even in a virtual environment. So uh, that's the last slide on where we are. Um, and then I'll go on to moving forward. So I don't know if there's any questions on the operational systems. Ms. Stancer? Um, regarding the searches, the two administrative searches, is yep. there a 
process for getting feedback that you would normally do through a, a public meeting? Yeah, so we're still working through, ex oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, I can't see people, so I jump in too quickly. Um, sorry, Ms. Stanter. Oh, I guess that was it. So, uh, yes, yeah, so um, we're still finalizing that, but I think um, there's a couple different ways to do it. We may look at our system like this, where we get questions in advance from members of the community um, and different stakeholder groups. The, the candidates, the however many finalists there are, usually two or three, answer them. Uh, and we can both live stream that as well as save the video and send it out so that we can get electronic feedback from anyone in the community who wants. Um, so we're still trying to figure out whether we should do that a little more synchronously or asynchronously and what would be the better way to get feedback. Um, but I think in the next week, Pelham's about a week ahead of the middle school search and and uh, you'll hear about that process moving forward. But absolutely, um, I think there actually are some benefits of not having to literally go to a forum, but being able to get it emailed to you and watching the video and being able to uh, offer feedback. Again, I'm always the silver lining person, but um, I think there it may actually engender more participation in the process. I'm not seeing any other questions from the committee. Okay, so three things moving forward. Uh, so talking about April break, talking about potential for return date for school, which Mr. Demling asked earlier, and planning for fall school year 2021. My phone is blowing up because I think Dr. Fauci is talking about fall of what it's going to look like nationally. So I don't know what he's saying. I just know I'm getting a lot of texts about it. So um, for April break, um, there's been a question and the commissioner of education, uh, and this is going to be a theme, has decided that it should be a local decision uh, as opposed to some other states that have made decisions around it. Uh, I met with the head of the APEA, which is our largest union. It's not the only union, but it's the largest union. And we decided, and we were hearing feedback both ways um, from staff and families, that we would survey the staff and really have that be um, the lead in the decision. Because I could really see it both ways. The one thing we both agreed to is we weren't asking staff if we should do away with April break altogether. That we think there was enough people who felt like um, this transition was stressful, that this um, time is stressful, that for our staff having some breaks. So the two options we offered staff for feedback one was to continue to not uh, continue to have April break as it was scheduled, uh, have that whole week off, uh, which many districts are doing. Um, and the second option was to have school that Thursday, Friday of April break. So in other words, have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, uh, but have a two day week. And the nice part of that is that pushes the end of the school year from Monday, the 22nd or 23rd to a Thursday. So no one likes coming back for a half day on Monday uh, at the end of the school year. So we thought that might be an incentive for staff members to take it more seriously. And this is the data. Um, we had 377 responses, which both Mick and I would say it was remarkably good for a one day survey. Um, and you could see that 86% roughly of staff favored having a three day um, week of April vacation uh, and have distance learning 2.0 on that Thursday and Friday of that week, and which would have the year end on Thursday, June 18th. And um, to get 86 people in, in this community to agree on something is, is uh, no small feat. So we take that really seriously. Uh, but on a serious note, having 14% of staff wanting the full week off kind of reinforced the piece while, while it's still a minority opinion among the faculty, uh, we're glad we didn't push to have the whole week off because that's people are dealing with a lot. And that 13.8% may have additional stressors that the 86% don't have. And we want uh, going back a couple of slides, we want to make sure we're supporting the mental health of everybody. And um, that 13.8% is not an insignificant number to, and I know Mick would agree. I think it's worth noting this survey went to all staff, not just APEA members. Uh, we just worked on it together. Um, so we'd like to announce that uh, moving forward that uh, we would have school on the Thursday and Friday. A lot of the feedback and comments were that everyone will still be here anyway, right? No one is um, going on vacation those weeks, or at least they shouldn't be. Um, but it gives a little bit of a, a breather for, for students and families um, during a, a nice time of year to take a breather. It's been a very stressful last month for everyone involved. And, and as we transition to Distance Learning 2.0, that is going to be, uh, you know, an additional stressor for both students and families and, and staff. And so we thought, you know, having a, a longer weekend, uh, but still getting in some learning that week made a lot of sense. Um, and, and again, the staff agreed. So we'd like to move forward with that. Um, 
certainly I'll, I'm happy to take any feedback or questions from the from the committee before I, uh, this is the only slide on this particular topic. Are there any questions? I'm seeing none. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we'll just uh, look out for that announcement. You know, there's a lot of announcing going on this week, so we'll try to probably put in the Friday newsletter so everyone gets it um, same time. Except for those of you who are watching the show, and then you'll uh, you'll know a little ahead of time. Um, so this is a more complicated conversation: the return to school date that Mr. Deming raised. So, um, you know, Governor Baker said, and this is a direct quote from his formal statement, that K to 12 schools shall not op reopen for normal operations before May 4th. Um, the problem is, from my perspective, the governor's statement is being interpreted by many to mean we will likely return our on May 4th, and there's a date attached. And I think it's human nature that when you think about, when you put out not before May 4th, everyone's gonna focus on the date. And so I'm having an increasing number of staff, students, and uh, families get in touch with me with a lot of concerns about that date, concerns, frankly, that I have as well. Um, but it's starting to get, uh, I'm starting to reconsider how to approach this because uh, it's stress that I don't feel like people need to have right now. Um, the governor's stay home order expires the morning of. I find it really hard to imagine that we'll go straight from stay home order to getting kids on a bus six hours later to having 950 students in our high school, right? That just seems all the experts, uh, even the people who disagree on when this whole thing will end, no one is suggesting that you go straight from um, where we are now to normal, um, typical life um, straight through. Uh, and I'm really deeply concerned um, because it feels um, the cognitive dissonance of of having that statement uh, with May 4th as a date out there. Um, I think it, it actually challenges the the confidence people have in leadership. And while that's not my decision, I'm responsible for this. I feel responsible for this district, as I know you all do too. Uh, and I don't like people to have cognitive dissonance on something like this during a time where there's already a lot of stress. Um, so increasingly, I'm getting concerned. And it really has uh, the spring break question, the April break question has really elicited a lot of feedback on the May 4th piece because people are feeling like we'll have this break and we don't know, to Mr. Deming's point, we don't know how long it'll go. And um, I, I honestly think it's, it's a week of a lot of holidays for a lot of faiths. Uh, if miraculously this goes way incredibly better than the, uh, seemingly every expert says, I think there'll still be a lot of staff and families who will be very concerned about a May 4th return date um, and I, I just don't, I, I just don't think it's feasible to be very candid with you. Uh, I put some slides, um, just the top right one is, this is from the federal government. It's kind of, uh, unfortunately a morbid one, but I think it, it just shows their projections. Again, this isn't number of cases of COVID-19. This is number of, um, deaths per day. And I only put this one up because it, it projects out pretty far. And if you look at May 1st, um, it's not close to on a national level, uh, when, uh, we'll see the curve going down enough where, you know, it seems like it'd be safe for students to return to school and staff members. Uh, secondly, um, a couple, let's see, the sixth today is the seventh. So yesterday, this was in the paper that uh, folks at Bay State, which is the largest teaching hospital or the only teaching hospital, I believe, in Western Massachusetts, um, they suggested that the peak, you know, out here will come later than perhaps in other areas and come in May. Um, so there's no indication, there's no evidence or data that suggests that May 4th is actually a reasonable date we would return to school. Um, and here you just see the um, the Hampshire, this is all public information. I, I'm not I, I'm not privy to anything that um, goes beyond this, but uh, Hampshire County and Franklin County COVID-19 cases. Um, and you could see the, the increase. And if you think of where we closed school, we were on March 13th. Um, so it was still pretty low. Um, and you can see where it is now, and to think that it'll drop to the same levels um, that quickly seems against any advice I'm getting from any public health official, um, any hospital in the area, or really the, the government, you know, the federal government's guidance as well. Um, so we end up in this awkward situation. I feel like I am in an awkward situation, just to be very candid about it, where every my all of my formal communication says we won't we will return, we will return to school no earlier than March, May 4th which is an arbitrary date that I think is becoming increasingly unrealistic. So what I'd love your feedback on is, you know, there's sort of two options. One, we could maintain our current model and double down on the communication that the closure will end no sooner than May 4th. Uh, I'll be honest and frank that uh, I'm fine continuing to do that. I think no matter how many times I say the no sooner part, the May 4th part is what sticks out in people's minds. It's human nature. Um, 
or the second one, which is something that over the last four days I've been I've been thinking a lot about, and and I really want your feedback. Changing the designation to an indefinite school closure uh, and being indefinite until public health officials deem it appropriate for students and staff to return. And the reason I've been thinking about the second one is it's uh, to me it it feels more honest uh, and accurate. Um, it's not. Uh, pretending that there's a hypothetical date that I know of or anyone else knows of where it'll be safe for students to and staff to return for school. Um, I know indefinite is um, the flip side of it is it's um, it removes any um, date from there, but I actually think that's the environment we're in. Uh, I think we're in an environment where we don't know. We know May 4th is, is very unrealistic, uh, even if realistic from a health perspective, from a public confidence perspective, I find it wildly unrealistic. Um, and indefinite is is accurately describes how I feel about this when we'll return to school. It, it really is up to public health officials. Uh, There's so many variables um, that we're seeing, and when you think about it's different setting at college and universities because they're um, you know students are living there as opposed to living at home, uh, but how quick they were. Um, to make school closure decisions. Um, and I know increasingly there's some conversation at college universities, not necessarily locally, that there may be, I don't know, but in other states, um, about even questions about summer programs, whether they have to shut down summer programs um, because there are concerns about that. Uh, I think we're up to 10 other states that have closed for the spring. Uh, I'm not suggesting that in Amherst we make that decision right now, but uh, I'd really love your feedback on this because uh, again, to go back to the beginning, uh, I'm concerned about its impact on the morale, the psyche uh, of our stakeholder groups here in Amherst. Um, and no matter how many times I tell people no sooner than May 4th, they remember the last two words of that statement and not the beginning. So um, I, I guess um, I'm not looking to make a decision tonight, but I am looking for committee's feedback on uh, their thoughts on kind of this dilemma that, that I and we face. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely. Oh, am I there? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely inclined to to agree with uh, changing it to to the word indefinite because I mean, everything is indefinite right now. And yeah. like you say, in interactions with you know with the community and people within the the school system, May Fourth is like this bright shining yeah object, but it it's undefined. So I, I think indefinite is perfect. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, um, so I, I do like the theme of, of the second phrasing better. Um, I don't know if it's just my ears, but when I, when, I, when I first heard it, it made me think of next school year as well. So when, <laughs> when we think schools are closed indefinitely, that might mean we're not coming back for years. And you know, I'm, I don't wanna put any percent chances on you know, what exact date is, because that's, that's not what we're here to do. Um, I, th I thought, you know, one alternative possibility to consider would be uh, schools are closed for the year until public health officials, et cetera. Um, you're certainly not making any promises about what happens in September, right. um, but it, it does say that for this school year, they're closed until, until it's appropriate to open them. I, 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 do, I do agree, though, with the, the more general first point that um, it's not helping at this point to have May 4th. Um, I mean, I'm probably not the only school committee member uh, who uh, gets questions um, saying, you know, so when are when are schools really going to close? Because we all know that it's not going to be May fourth, and you know, and I'll honestly say I don't have any any insider information, and um, you know, neither does anybody else. Um, the other comment I had about the, the phrasing of the second option here is until public health officials deem it appropriate. And while I certainly wouldn't say that the school committee or superintendents are better qualified to assess a medical situation than public health officials, it does beg the question, okay, which public health officials? No, right? that's a good point. Yeah. We talked about our districts, uh, you know, Amherst and uh, or the region's health officials, the state health officials who might right. make a different call in the Boston area um, mm -hmm. when the conditions may be different out in Western Mass. Um, right. So I'm not sure whether that might confusingly transfer the, the autonomy of the decision which is really yours um, yeah. to, to, to health officials, even though like when you close school, when it's snowing, you're deferring to the, the weather experts, even though you're the one who's making the call, right? Right. Um, so it's a good point. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a clear answer for you there, but um, I think you're heading in the right direction. 
Yeah, no, that's helpful. And I will just comment on your uh, other part about you get questions. So I get them every day for my six-year-old, let alone the rest of the community. And I keep telling him the same thing I told you. I don't know, right? <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. And and uh, I think that the, the sooner we can be honest about it and whatever the wording is, and that's really helpful feedback, um, you know, I, I think the transparency in this situation really helps. Um, uh, and I think it just helps in terms of public confidence that we're not putting out a, a hypothetical date that we don't actually believe. So, but thanks, Peter. That, that, that's really helpful for me to think a little bit about uh, the language of that. I see Ms. Spitzer, and then I think Mr. Menino, you had your hand up earlier too. So we'll start with Ms. Spitzer. Um, so, you know, I, I, I work in health. Um, as a manager. I'm, not, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I have been on, you know, conference calls where we've been talking about the models that were, were just being shown. And there are Today I was in a call and they discussed about six different options of modeling. So I think you can kind of choose choose the model, but no matter what the models, um, at least what I've been hearing, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I've talked to some experts on this, is that like early May, the peak there is kind of the earliest that we'd see it. And it's very likely that it could happen late May, June, and in some cases even July, depending on how effective the social distancing that we're doing is, it'll you know, flatten that curve, which would be a really good thing um, in terms of keeping our hospitals, um, ICU beds open to receive patients. But um, the bad thing is that our kids will probably have to stay out of school longer because I think the social right. distancing, you know, we really, the schools are one of the places where this type of disease can thrive. And so um, I think I, I personally can't see a situation in which we would potentially be going back to school this year. And I think to acknowledge that and to give all of these folks feeling a lot of uncertainty, some, I, some something to plan for, I guess is helpful. I, I, um, I don't, I think it's also because, um, because there are so many families who kind of depend on the schools for everything from nutrition to um, just childcare, you know, uh, and all of these supports that our schools offer. It's a really, really hard thing to tell people. Um, but I almost yeah. feel like it's- Yeah, better. and if I could comment on that. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, Karen. No, go. But I just feel like if you get that information out, it gives people time to plan and adjust to the new reality and uh, ad adapt. And, and it also allows us to start, you know, doing all of the things that we've already started doing and rolling out the supports that people need. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, I don't disagree with everything you just said. I think I'm not probably at the place to say that we're not coming back to a fall publicly, but I think what I'm trying to strike the balance of is saying that's likely the case, and I think being transparent about that, uh, and just wiping away the May 4th thing. You know, like if miraculously on May 15th, you know, um, things are much better than we planned, then, then, then that's okay. Um, but I think having that date in people's heads is um, is really not helpful for people. Um, so um, all this feedback is really helpful and I'm gladly this gets recorded and I get the video right afterwards so I can think through uh, all the feedback I'm getting and, and try to craft um, something that, um, that, that captures a lot of what I'm hearing. Um, this is great feedback. Mr. Menino, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I think it's best to plan on school being closed at the end of the school year, June 18th. It's silly. This is a serious situation. Uh, I, I'm no medical person, but I'm not leaving my house <laughs> until <laughs> uh, you can call it indefinite or use some kind of moderating words, but it, it also it would give the um, new computerized uh, uh, system a chance to work through rather than just work, you know, they don't, if a teacher learns how to teach online for the next three weeks, well, that's good. Then he can do it for, for the next eight weeks or 10 weeks. Uh, get, get the benefit of the learning curve. But yeah. plan on June 18th. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, I would add a sort of, and, and sort of building on what Ms. Spitzer was, was saying earlier, also this idea of you know, nothing certain right now. Um, and and it's not just the uncertainty, it's that the daily, if not hourly, changing and shifting of sort of how we're understanding our environment and our world. And 
sort of having a date out there, even if it is no earlier, um, and and sort of you know s sitting there in anticipation that you know on May third we're going to all of a sudden hear news about when the new date is going to be um, is is a little unsettling. And so if we can sort of and I think Miss Spitzer, you were you were getting at this also, which is by saying something that gets too indefinite, and I agree with Mr. Demling's comment about, you know, indefinite suggests that this could bleed into next school year as well. But something that gets at, we don't anticipate that this school year will be back this particular school year unless things dramatically change. That gives people as as disappointing and challenging as that news is going to be to hear. It at least gives people a stake in the ground, okay, I don't have to just get through these next 10 days. I, I can start thinking and planning and it. And even though that's not certain, it's something that's at least you know manageable. You can sort of think through and see through, okay, I need to figure out how I'm gonna get through June as yeah. opposed to, well, I gotta get through now and then wait to hear if I, it's gonna continue. Um, and so the solutions that we as families and, and students and teachers and staff put together to sort of cope with this new situation can be a little bit more permanent feeling or at least stable because we're not sort of just, you know, just trying to do this balancing act temporarily. Yeah. Um, I saw several hands. I saw Ms. Spitzer, Ms. Stancer, and Mr. Deming. I'll start with Ms. Stancer because you haven't spoken yet. Thank you. Um, another piece really that I think supports the idea that we're probably not going back to school is the fact that nobody even has a clue how we're going to go back in this you know i heard something tonight news about uh they're tr they're trying to develop a test for the antibodies i mean how because they don't even know how do you go back to what would be potentially a normal life they, they don't have a clue how to go about doing that so to me that's another reason that i think about probably not going back to school this year is what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, Mr. Demling. Um, yeah, so uh, I, th I think Dr. Morris, I heard you say a little bit what I, th I think is like the clearest indication to me so far, which is um, you're not ready to say that schools are definitely closed, going to be closed for the rest of the school year, but it's likely. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you feel that, that you should say that. Yeah. Um, but Schools are closed indefinitely, likely for the rest of the school year. I mm -hmm. think that simply that telling people, hey, look, you're not ready to like, you know, X marks this marks the spot, but in your opinion, in the superintendent's opinion, we're likely not going back to school for the rest of the school year. I yeah. think that would be very informative. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer, did you? I just I just wanted to add to my comments that all the modeling um that I've had privy to through my conversations at work has been showing um, that we're going to be far behind Boston, likely. Yeah. Um, and that's the same thing. So th I, I think the thing is that people may not realize if you're following news outlets that are out of places like New York or Boston is that the peak is going to be there in the next couple of weeks, but it's very likely going to take a lot longer to get out to more rural communities. So whereas upstate New York is going to be a lot later than New York City in the same way, Western Mass is likely going to be a lot later than Boston. And so that can maybe cause a little dissonance if you're following like the Boston Globe or the New York Times or even just President Trump and when they're making announcements about um, when the peak is. So I think that's important to keep in mind when we're communicating is that it's the 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 press is often covering bigger cities and we're different. So um, I wondered if, um, she, I don't mean to put her on the spot, but Ms. Gribko, if you had anything, any thoughts from a student perspective, and certainly you can pass, but I just was curious because you're here and um, I don't get to see many students that aren't my own kids lately. So um, if you had any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, so um, I think as students, a lot of us are sort of, I guess, predicting that we're not going to go back this year. Mm -hmm. And I think that having the May fourth day is just sort of um it's like making the students feel that like we're not getting all the information communicated to us properly right. and I think that the indefinite wording or like the indefinite to the end of the school year might be a little more clear about 
you know, like what we can plan for for learning and how we're going to talk about like MCAS and all those things. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but I just was very curious what you were thinking. Okay. So uh, very last slide again, apologize for the, I think it's the last slide. Oh, almost, um, is just planning for fall or whenever we come back. Um, I think the things to note, and I'll just be brief on this one, because this is one of the things that as we get through the implementation of Learning 2.0, our next step is going to be thinking about the return. Uh, the thing I can say very publicly and confidently, it's not going to look like a beginning, typical beginning of the school year. Uh, and first and foremost, we're going to have to focus on building, rebuilding our communities, social emotional learning, and uh, just as I mentioned before, reintroduction of being in groups and in-person learning. Um, I had a neighbor email me today, which was just so weird. She's three doors down. Um, but, you know, that's like the, the world we live in, and, and that's not the world we're hopefully going to come back to. Um, so I think a lot of that's going to have to be the focus at the end of the school year. Additionally, we'll have to develop a plan to better determine where students are, because we know that students will have been out of school for, for an extended period of time, um, and make the necessary adjustments in the curriculum. Um, but I think that is very much secondary to the focus on uh, the reintroduction and, and kind of, you know, being socialized again of being in groups physically, uh, you know, um, there's few things that happen where you think there's really a before and after. This is a thing, right, COVID-19 and how it's affecting uh, folks, and I'll just focus on the local piece, uh, but certainly there's a broader implications, uh, that there's going to be a before and after. And so uh, I think rethinking about what that after looks like is where our mind's going to go in the next couple of weeks, and certainly we'll be fortunate to have the summer to do some thinking and planning about that. Um, but it's it's gonna be a big transition and I wanna be really public. I don't have the plan, I don't have it mapped out, but, but I do know what I care about, which is that since the staff come back and we focus a lot on what it's like to be back together. Uh, and yes, we have to teach academics. I'm not suggesting we don't, um, but that's gonna come after we rebuild the community and not before. Um, so that's really all I wanna say. I know I've spoken a lot on this slide deck and if there's any other general questions or comments, I'm happy to answer them. Mr. Deming, can you briefly um, mention your current thinking on graduating seniors uh, in terms of needing the ne necessary credits to graduate? Um, mm -hmm. And also, I mean, I know this is like way down on the list, but if you're a graduating senior, there's graduation typically, and that's a huge, you know, milestone achievement event. And um, I'm I'm presuming that that's not happening, you know, if, at least in the form that we're typically used to this year. So, any initial right. thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, in terms of the plans, and, th and this was in uh, Principal Jones' letter, um, any students who maybe who, who are 12th grade students or students who are on, uh, hopefully on pace to graduate who are perhaps need to change some things to get the credits they need to graduate, they're either were failing a course or something like that, uh, the counselors will be reaching out to them individually uh, in the next week to develop a plan of how to get there. And... Um, and we'll have to monitor and keep track of that throughout uh, for all students. And I think the credit, no credit thing, I think what's important to note in the commissioner's letter and re recommendations we're taking that seriously is we also have to be conscious of other commitments that happen. So a student may have a personal situation with illness in their family, illness themselves that have to be taken into account. Uh, really we're, you know, the credit, this is gonna sound strange, the bar to receive no credit is a really high bar. You know, it will require a lot of staff outreach and. Uh, a lot of explanation before we get there because we know it's a very difficult situation for everybody to have uh, to be in. I think on the graduation piece, you know, it's interesting. I'm following this uh, at the university level just because I'm their graduations are earlier and they've already canceled them all. So I'm um, trying to see what they're doing. Uh, and it's interesting. Some places have canceled them and just made broad decisions. I was talking to Principal Jonas about this today, and I don't mind saying this in, in public, is, you know, one of the things we're talking about is trying to, if, if we get to the place where we are canceling graduation, uh, can we survey students about some thoughts they have? I know some places have done graduations done virtual environment. Some places students have advocated to come back and do like a mega graduation a year from June uh, or a year from May in the university setting uh, because they want the opportunity of physically walking across the stage. And so what Principal Jones and I talked about is not necessarily making a decision, but perhaps having a menu of options and then 
an, an other box because I know our students will use the other box with creative solutions that we haven't thought of. So I think when we get to that decision point, we'll have to engage students as well as faculty, but particularly graduating students and see what would work. And that's not that everyone's necessarily going to agree on exactly how they want that to happen. We want their voices to guide it because the graduation is primarily for them and their families. Um, and it's primarily for them, I would argue. I and mean, the family piece is certainly huge. I don't want to minimize that. But we want to know how our 17 and 18 year olds and 19 year olds, uh, how they'd want to walk through that. Um, very unusual process and what we're not interested in doing is making a sweeping decision for them other than the ones about if it's not safe to be in the Mullen Center we're not going to be in the Mullen Center. Um, we have been in touch with the Mullen Center they're aware of our situation and they're just going to call us every two weeks to see if we have an update for them um, but they are having the problem with everyone who would preserve the Mullen Center so we are no different than perhaps your little perhaps more popular musical acts and athletic events or anything else. Um, and they're very conscious of uh, the limitations, not just on our schooling, but actually on having large groups together. Uh, I find it highly unlikely that in June, um, anywhere, there'll be opportunities for large groups to be together in that kind of scale, right? If you look at professional sports um, and the discussions happening there, you get a little bit of a, um, a window into how people are thinking about that. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer. So um, thanks again for all of this. I guess there, there are two two questions that um, weren't covered. So one I have is we've been seeing in the news all of these stories about people 3D printing face shields or, you right. know, so, and I, I do know that, you know, we had a great presentation. Sorry for the background noise. Um, we had Mine will be coming very soon. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had all these um, great presentations about 3D printing capabilities. Has there been any thoughts of trying to use those um, in our, from our high school? And then secondly, um, I just think it's really important that our schools kind of are places where people get information about a lot of things. And I'm wondering what we've been communicating about kind of instilling the norms of social distancing and kind of communicating the importance. Just like today I was walking and there was high school, uh, college students were partying down the street for me, you know, having a drinking game. And I know our high school students are much more responsible, but I think it's the young people because they kind of feel invincible may not be taking it as seriously. So if you could just comment on what you're doing around that. Sure. So on the first one, um, our 3D printers are mostly in schools where we're not letting staff be. Uh, and our RIS staff have been entirely focused on getting Chromebooks, uh, the, the training for staff, uh, getting uh, and reducing the digital divide. So I've seen some districts do that. It, it's certainly, we have the capability of doing it, but in terms of human power, we're dedicating it to digital divide and training staff right now. Um, we are, uh, I will say we are donating our, our nurse leader, um, Joe Consolino was in grabbing some supplies that we feel like we have an excess of and are dedicating, are donating that to the Amherst first responders, the Amherst fire department. Um, so uh, we're not trying to make as big a deal about that, but we are, I will say that we are donating uh, primarily gloves is what we have um, in excess in nurses, nurses' offices, and we're donating that to the Amherst Fire Department. Uh, on the second question, it's funny you mentioned that because what we're noticing, and I heard from principals literally like in the last three hours about this, um, are more reports of families, um, more reports of students having social gatherings together, not in the way that you necessarily described, um, but even just like groups of kids going on bike rides together, not six feet apart, and and so we hadn't heard many reports of that and something perhaps seems like it flipped this week where we're hearing more. It's all anecdotal, so I don't have hard data on it. Um, but before this meeting, I talked to the town manager and was in touch with the public health department in Amherst, trying to get some level of statement to put in the newsletter. Not that everyone reads a newsletter, you know, front and back, but just to remind folks of uh, what they're telling us and, and that, you know, the police will come and break up social gatherings and, and, uh, I want to say it's really important to note that it's happening in, uh, we're getting reports in all different kind of communities. It's not, um, it's not particular to one neighborhood or anything like that. So we hadn't gotten many of those reports. And in the last day and a half, uh, we seem to have gotten more of them. And whether that's a trend or whether it's just the anecdotal reports actually got to us, right? It's hard to, hard to judge. Um, we don't have tracking devices where we can uh, do that. Um, but it is concerning and our principals, both uh, a number of principals reached out to me today because they were starting to hear reports of that. The weather got a lot nicer too, so. I think that, that may be part of it. And, that, and But you know, I do think people can start relaxing sometimes, right? It's 
It's been a while. It's hard to maintain this level of, right? Um, you know, I was on a hike with one of my kids and there was a young kid, probably three or four, who ran over to my daughter uh, and the parents had to hold her back. And it wasn't because she knew my, like, I don't know this family and they didn't know us, but, you know, they were, they were then shouting at me from 20 feet away that, you know, their daughter's a really social kid and it's really, really challenging for them to not have her physically, it's hard, hard for their daughter and therefore hard for them. Um, so I think, do you think the longer this goes on, it, it is hard for many families and students to maintain the physical distancing that um, we need to for a public health, for, from a public, public health perspective. And I do worry a little bit, as you said, Ms. Bitzer, about some backslide on that. Sorry, ending a down note, but. Any other questions? Comments? No? no? Okay. So uh, we were ahead and now we're way behind. <laughs> Sorry, 15 minutes probably wasn't reasonable for <laughs> COVID-19. <laughs> really great presentation. So thank you. It's comprehensive. Um, I think answered almost every question that we could possibly have thought of ahead of time. So thank you. Um, so the next item is um, the appointment of a school committee member to our negotiating team. Yep, so I can explain that. So we are in negotiations or we're starting trying to start negotiations with our food service union. They're the only union that's up for a contract this year. Uh, their contract's up this year, excuse me. Uh, the member who was on that negotiating team was Mr. Fonch. Um, he, as you all know, is no longer on the regional school committee. So um, we do need somebody on the regional school committee to serve um, on that negotiating team this spring. Uh, from a time commitment perspective, we haven't had that much experience with food service uh, negotiations because we just recently have went in, but uh, past experiences would suggest it's not as lengthy a process as it is with the, some of our unions that have many more members. Um, it's not that they're any less important or uh, the, the issues are easier, but when the APEA is negotiating on behalf of several hundred members, it's, uh, it's a little more complex perhaps than uh, a smaller group um, of employees. So it's not an incredible amount of time, but it, it is real time. Um, we don't have necessarily have a, a schedule set. Um, we're waiting for the committee member and then we'll go from there on that. And Ms. Cunningham is the one who facilitates those, um, those negotiations. Don't all volunteer at once. <laughs> Mr. Harrington. Yeah, be open to it if nobody else was. That didn't work, did it? I heard you. I think you said okay. what I heard was that you would volunteer if no one else would. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I think um, I, I think everybody's silence is a is a grateful um, head nod to your <laughs> your willingness to step up, Mr. Harrington. So. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Harrington. Um, go back to the agenda. So next on our agenda is the FY21 budget update. Yep, and I'll share the beginning. I'll turn to Mr. Slaughter for a little bit. This will actually be a brief update because uh, what we have to share is uh, incredibly not specific. And part of that is because there was supposed to be a live stream meeting at the state house to update on the state budget picture and they couldn't work out the technology so it got delayed a week. So we were really excited for this agenda item to be today because we'd have fresh information. And unfortunately, Mr. Slaughter, Dr. Slaughter uh, waited on a conference call that never happened. Um, so um, what I will say is that we were both on a conference call last week and the DESE is uh, told us explicitly that they're fully expecting that no regional district will have a past budget on July 1st. Uh, in the Commonwealth. They said they're happy to be pleasantly surprised, but their guiding assumption is that no regional district will actually have a past budget. Um, they also indicated and then followed up with me, which was really helpful because a couple of us had some strong feelings about a 112th budget. And 112th budget is a month by month budget that sets the state sets um, for district, regional districts, if they don't pass a budget by July 1st. Actually, now they can do it. This year, they're going to be able to do that for municipal districts as well. It's a little different than in the past. Usually, it was just regional. But I'll focus on region because that's our um, the committee here tonight. Um, and so um, 
they indicated that typically the one twelfth budget defaults to the statutory method, um, but that's under normal circumstances, and these aren't normal circumstances, and that DESE would look at each situation uniquely. So uh, as you may know from past years when we were in budget duress or budget questions, the if we failed it, there was the piece of, well, the state's going to come in and they'll automatically go to the statutory method. And I have an email from an administrator at DESE indicating the opposite, that you know this isn't normal situation and they'll work with local school committees and local districts to figure out what a 112th budget would look like. Um, and uh, I think the only other update I have before um, Dr. Slaughter can jump in is that uh, Amherst Town Keats Council is meeting every week. Uh, at this point, the Shootsbury has set their, uh, rescheduled their town meeting date to the very end of June, June 27th, 6th, something like that. Uh, Pelham today reset theirs to June 6th, I believe it was. Leverett has decided to not set a date uh, at the current time. They're going to wait and see what the situation is. I think as all you could all imagine, uh, in the current situation, getting that many people together uh, in one setting would not necessarily be the most um, wise or allowable thing. Um, so when they said that they don't expect anyone, my interpretation, see if Dr. Slaughter agrees with me, when they said they expect no regional district to um, pass a budget, part of it's that they don't expect regional towns to all be able to have town meetings this spring. And part of it's that there's so much uncertainty, both in local budgets, but particularly in the state budget, that uh, it'll be hard to form a budget that actually uh, would have time enough to be debated and pass multiple communities uh, before July 1st. But Dr. Slaughter may have more insights than me on that. So I'll turn it to him. No, I don't really have a lot more to add. I think that's that's absolutely the, the, the critical thing is that the timeline becomes so short, um, you know, once we get to a place of being able to get into groups and towns have meetings, like a Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury, um, you know, the, the just the mechanics of trying to go through the process is going to take some time. I think the other thing as we roll over into July 1 is that to set a 112th budget, the state's going to have to have a budget um, as well. And so, or, or at least we're going to have to have some sense of what local aid looks like in, in each of our communities. And, and that's going to vary, very diff vary considerably between the different communities um, as we move ahead. So we're going to keep a close eye on that. Um, you know, uh, Amherst has a particularly different uh, connection to uh, local aid than, than the other three communities. And so that'll be a big factor for Amherst. Um, and, and again, I think that just, you know, the, the nature of how this uh, uh, virus plays out and when we can actually come together and have these kinds of meetings and have significant conversations about uh, the budget and then subsequently have the, the town meetings to vote on those budgets is just gonna take a little bit of time. So um, I'm hopeful and I'll say this here, and I've, I've not shared this with the superintendent, but but I, I'm hopeful that the state will give us some flexibility around E&D. Um, currently, we have a limit of 5%, you know, that, that we bump up against. And, and it's not that we're not expecting to sort of spend money, but I could see a situation in many regional schools where by virtue of how the district and the spending plays out at the end of the year and the tight timeframes that you might we might be working under at the in June, um, you could end up sitting on more uh, money than you really want to and to have some flexibility to then subsequently spend it in the new fiscal year uh, could be really helpful because I think there'll be expenses we just won't know until after July 1. And so to have some flexibility there as far as closing one year and starting the next would be very helpful, but I don't know if we'll get that or not. Unmute myself. Sorry, uh, Mr. Demling. Um, yeah. So, uh, Mrs. Slaughter, thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, you know, when I think about what's going to happen with the state budget from an advocacy point of view, um, I, I fear that the the um, decision dynamic is going to be a lot like what happened with the two trillion dollar stimulus at the federal level, which, which is you have this massive amount of of change happening in a very short period of time and certain things are gonna get overlooked and there's really not gonna be a lot of time. So uh, it's good to focus on these details because you know we're, we're gonna try and get our reps uh, attention you know, during this because uh, there's, there's a few other things I think we should focus on, but um, uh, it, I think it will be good to, to look at those details. I, I did also wanna say before we left the budget item, if anyone's watching this um, and you're, you're wondering how you can help um, public schools um, 
in, in the future. Uh, we, we did all get this in the mail, or you, or you should have. Um, I'm going to do a little visual here, um, Ms. McDonald. This is the MASC newsletter, and it's probably not uh, large enough font to read, but their headline is 2020 Census is Critical to School Funding. Um, and I, I won't I'll, I'll read all the details, but basically there's an enormous amount of uh, federal funding that comes in that is based on uh, census. And uh, so the very strong recommendation of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Association of School Committees is for school committees to do a lot of public awareness about how critical it is uh, to report the census, report everybody who's in our districts, uh, and to encourage your friends and family to do the same. So um, obviously COVID-19 is going to dominate our discussions for the rest of the, the year, um, but I just wanted to give a pitch to the census um, to make sure it keeps bubbling up on our um, public relations radars that we continue to encourage people to, um, to fill that out. Great, thank you. Ms. Stancer. May I ask Peter Demling a question? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> how do you get that newsletter? I've never seen one. <laughs> um, so there must be some registration link I followed uh, when I first came on the committee at uh, masc.org. Um, I can I can uh, send you a, a link offline if you if you remember uh, uh, remind me. Um, but yeah, MASC membership is really great. Um, they send you updates through email as well, and there's um, free seminars and whatnot. So it's a good organization to be part of. Thank you. I would appreciate the link. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on budget? Ms. Spitzer? Um, I would like to just echo Peter's emphasis on the census, especially um, in our community where now all of the college students are actually not here on April 1st. So I'm actually quite concerned that Amherst is going to have a major undercount issue because our schools have been, our, our higher ed schools have been closed. Um, I guess the other other thing I wanted to just, I mean, my gut is that we're going to be facing um a really negative budget situation when we actually do get around to being able to make one. And and I guess, are we already, I'm hoping you guys are already starting to make some plans or contingency plans about how we're going to deal with the potential decline in income from tax base and potentially, you know, all of the other sources that we rely on. Um, and how can we be supportive in and kind of move, being proactive about what I'm sure is going to be a difficult situation in the months and years to come. Yeah, so we're starting to do that. Um, I think the the hours in the day problem is a, a big one, and I think the particular uncertainty in the regional district uh, is, is substantially different than in the elementary municipal districts. Uh, I'm not saying the situation, the budget situation, would be easier or harder, but the level of uncertainty at a regional district is is that much greater so we are looking broadly at just you know what vacancies would naturally emerge th those types of things but i think in the next couple of weeks both in the state and the local level we'll probably get a little more information and be able to be um, a little more clinical in how we approach the task so at a broad level absolutely um, and i would say we're probably two weeks away from getting enough information to have more informed conversations moving forward and dr slaughter wants to jump in so one other thing that uh that came up in in one of the many um, video conference calls I've been on uh, that that was something that hadn't it, as yet crossed my mind until until recently. Uh, you know, you've certainly heard a, a strong uh, message about the number of people applying for unemployment benefits. Um, that will subsequently have a cascading effect on the number of people that qualify for free and reduced lunch. And so our supports that we're going to need to have in place around our uh, free and reduced lunch programs, but also the you know other things that that tie into that. In other words, that's an indicator of of need from a food standpoint. But obviously, there's a lot of need that people have in that regard. And you know the number of people that are potentially displaced from their jobs and may not be back in their jobs for a considerable amount of time will be a significant factor. Um, and I think that'll be another piece that we're trying to sort of Keep in mind as we start to plan for next year, um, as well as you know, understanding you know the, the circumstances we've already discussed. Just very briefly, uh, just to, to support that point, we're seeing it even in, in as we've surveyed folks to see who doesn't have internet access. The number of people who have said, um, 
I've lost it in the last two weeks because I lost my job or I'm furloughed or um, I have it, but please keep me on the list because I don't anticipate being able to pay my bill this month. Um, it's really shocking. And it, you, you know, you, you know, you look at the unemployment data, you, you know, you can't help but see the paper, but when you see it on an individual level, it's really heartbreaking. Um, there's a lot of heartbreaking things, but just seeing it on, you know, an Excel sheet of who says they need internet access and, and we don't ask why, but families are volunteering that information to the person who's receiving these calls. Um, it, 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 you know, I'll just say, it, I don't want to belabor it, but it's just, it's incredibly sad. And I think it indicates the level of need that's going to grow in our community as well as everywhere else. I'm not seeing any more questions from the committee. No. Okay. So thank you. Um, next is planning for future meetings. Um, and uh, this, this was a topic that was added or suggested by Mr. Demling. Um, we um, typically at the end of our meetings, we have the agenda top, you know, topics for future meetings and we have a regular schedule of meetings, but in this um, environment, we, we are, are, we've um, moved to essential business only and sort of as, as needed. But I, I do think, um, uh, and, and Mr. Demling, I'll turn it over to you to sort of introduce sort of your thinking behind this, but just just to have the conversation about what would what type of discussion vote potential vote um business um that we would have that would warrant us coming together for another remote or virtual meeting in the future so mr demley did you want to add to that sure um so yeah um i so i guess i'm thinking about it in terms of those those two general areas you described the the, what, con what constitutes essential business, things that we either we are legally required to get to before the end of the school year or gosh darn it, even in a virtual state of emergency, we really ought to get to. Um, and then other things that we were, uh, that were in various stages of, of process before this all hit that are obviously still important because we were, you know, we were paying attention for a reason, but, but could to some degrees, uh, uh, depending on what it is, um, uh, be deferred. And I, I, I guess I just wanted to get an under, understanding from the superintendent um, and may, maybe from the chair a little bit about w what goes into column A and what goes into column B. Um, because, I mean, so just speaking from my own point of view, um, I'm, I'm very mindful in this time that uh, as a school committee, I think that we need to be very conscious to calibrate our workload so that we're not um, creating too much of a demand on our our leadership, on on our superintendent, and on our other school administrators, and um, who who do a lot of work to prepare for these meetings. And so, like one example for uh, is the superintendent uh, evaluation process. You know, last couple of years we've gotten this very comprehensive, very detailed artifacts document um, that doesn't come together in five minutes, right? <laughs> um, and that's just one detail of the superintendent evaluation process that we probably need to talk about what are we going to do differently this year. Um, so, and then there's some other topics that uh, aren't um, front of burner critical in an emergency situation, but but they were chugging along right until we stopped. And so I don't think it would be appropriate to have 15, 45 minute items um, that we require updates and grill the superintendent on <laughs> Q&A for, um, but it, it would be good for some for some of those lesser priority things just to know where they're at. Right, like for example, like uh, the sixth grade uh, grade span advisory board. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to bump that up to the top of the priority list in the middle of an emergency situation. Um, but you know, even a couple of minute update at one superintendent's update at one meeting to cover that and the other things that fall into that priority level, um, I think it would just be helpful just for general uh, communication. But uh, again, I I am very mind. So I'll just I'll wrap this sandwich comment <laughs> in with the same thing I said at the top, which is I'm very mindful not to want to add extra work uh, for the superintendent. I think the superintendent and school administration is doing an excellent job communicating and um, navigating this crisis uh, in, in the best way they can. And I want to make sure that the school committee is uh, helping and not hindering the that priority management. 
Dr. Morris? Maybe I'll suggest that if, uh, and I haven't talked to the acting chair about, right, this, this is happening live, but if there are topics that aren't about COVID-19 or budget, because those are going to be two things that we spend a lot of time on over the next two months, um, that people want to get updates on, if they could maybe share them with the chair and me individually, not, not sending them all, and then w working with the chair, we can try to map out what that might look like. Um, does that sound, you know, I just want to make sure every school member has access to be able to suggest topics, but uh, then I could work with the chair on, uh, you know, what we can what we can do, what we can't do, and then we can come back at our next meeting and share, you know, the list had 12 items. We prioritize these three. Does that sound about right? And uh, and have that conversation uh, after we've heard from everyone on the committee. Does that sound, as a process piece, does that sound agreeable to folks? <laughs> Seeing uh, thumbs up and head nods. <laughs> Great, I, I agree. I think that would be a good approach. Um, I do want to, so I, I think, um, and then from there we can de define what what is the next sort of meeting cadence and when our next meeting could, could be. Um, I think just to say out loud, um, I don't know about the rest of the committee, so I'm just, so it's part statement, part question. But um, I, my my calendar, personal calendar, still has all of our meetings on them. I haven't deleted them, so my sort of preference it would be if if we are going to be scheduling, you know, when we do schedule a next meeting, I would like to look at when we had originally had regional meetings on our calendars. Um, so maybe with a head nod, if folks think that that works for them, or if be given this new environment that we're in that we need to look at other alternative times than what we had originally put on our calendars stick to sort of the previous schedule okay great thank you um so unless there's further discussion on that Seeing none, then we'll move on to a warrant report. I need to get up and just grab some papers, but I'll be right back. All right. Apologies for the delay. Um, so Doug kindly came over to my house and I was able to sign some warrants. Um, and I'll report on them now. I, um, does the date that I signed them on matter or can I just read the, um, here we go. Sorry, I'm still getting used to this. He's shaking his head, so no, no. <laughs> Okay, so I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized um, by my signature to payables, my child's trying to come in at this very moment. Um, I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized my signature to payables in the amount of $299,888.38 for a warrant dated March 20th, 2020, which included general fund expenses of $293,204.52 revolving fund expenses of $2,390.11 and grant fund expenses of $4,293.75. In addition, um, I authorize by my signature to payables in the amount of $788,714.97 for the warrant dated March 18th, 2020, um, for payroll. Ah! One more. Um, I, Carrie Spitzer, also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $797,820.24 for a warrant dated March 19th, 2020, for general fund expenses. And that is it. Thank you very much. And I think just a comment on the on, on warrants. We we did receive um, information that we're looking at ways to be able to sign remotely, um, which is is great. It 
in this current situation. So it'll be, but thank you, um, Doug, for ferrying those around. <laughs> um, okay, our final item is accepting. We have some gifts. Anybody feel like reading? Ms. Spitzer? Sure. Okay. So I move to accept gifts from Shirley, the following gifts from Shirley, apologies from pronunciation, Musumechi, number 238, to support the Leo P. Vignol Scholarship in the amount of $500, and from the ARPS Friends of Performing Arts Incorporated, number 312, performing arts trip to support a performing arts trip student activity account in the amount of $2,384.03 for a total of $2,884.03. Second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Demling. Any questions, comments? Okay, so roll call vote, beginning with Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Mr. Menino. Menino, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. And McDonald, I. It carries six to zero. And before we go to our final, before we adjourn, I do want to, I neglected at the beginning to express huge thank you to Amherst Media for continuing to um, be in operation and help us uh, in live streaming this on um, on channel 15. So thank you so much for um, partnering with us in, in making this meeting accessible to the community. And I also um, made the mistake of introducing Ms. Grupko as a representative of the district. She's actually our student representative. So thank you, Emily, for joining us this evening. Do we have a motion? I move that we adjourn. <laughs> I second. Moved, moved by Menino and seconded by Spitzer, and there is no discussion. So roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Benino. Benino, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we are adjourned. <laughs>